thank you everybody for joining us today. Um, for those I probably know most of you, um, my name is Mike Schwartz, and I have been working with the Department of Education. As many of you knew, <clears throat> know, I came uh, um, probably a little over 20 years ago for you know six months or a year or so, and I am still working here. Um, but wonderful to be part of the Department of Ed. It's been great to be part of the education in New Hampshire and helping students throughout the state. Certainly appreciate all the work that all of you do uh, in your work at schools as well. And certainly from the grant perspective, this is really a nice opportunity for folks, you folks in schools to help create new opportunities that might be outside the um, typical um, budgets of your schools. Um, so thanks for joining us. I also know this is a vacation week for some of your schools, so I appreciate you being here during this week as well. And um, today's content is fairly light, so we may get done early, which will be great. You'll have a little time back to yourselves. Um, but today we're going to be talking about some of the student group and data measurements that the department collects as part of our systems that hopefully you can consider as you're using your uh, developing your grants. This session fits in to a series of sessions that I know some of you probably have already been to, um, and they're all focused on the idea of how to help you better develop your title grants. Um, there, I want to clarify kind of today's goal and the goal of kind of the last one and then where that fits into all these sessions, just so you get, so you get a better idea of how these all fit together. Um, let me just make sure I am good, I'm sharing. Um, so uh, two weeks ago, we had this session and it focused on looking at the New Hampshire Department of Education accountability measures. And part of the feeling, the belief is that the more schools can understand how the department's set up in terms of our accountability measures, the more you can you can use that information to, to create and ensure that your grant requests are in sync and kind of aligned with the overall goals of the state. Um, so we focused primarily on some of the metrics that are used from the state assessment test. Um, we talked about some of the other measurements, um, such as graduation rate and um, you know items dealing with both the NHSAS, the um, DLM, the SAT, and the access test. Um, so it was a focus on looking at those accountability measures. And the concept, again, was helping you understand where those measures exist in the department. So as you're building your grant requests, you're making sure that you understand the data and you're able, able to incorporate that into your requests. The session last week focused more on, okay, now that we've got all this data, how do you actually think about creating smart goals? And how do you think about you know, approaching um, your grant in general? Karen led that effort. And I'm gonna talk briefly about that in a minute. Um, today's session focuses again back on the data, once again, helping you understand what data is collected in the Department of Education. How might you consider that data as you're planning your requests? The session I did two weeks ago, this one, is not oriented so much on developing SMART goals or figuring out exactly what your measurements might be. Those will come, That will come through the rest of the trainings. We're going to dive into this, this data into a little bit more detail at a, a deeper level. Um, but hopefully the, the, together, these will collectively you know, help you as you're thinking about your grants. Logistics, um, we're happy you're here today, again, especially on this uh, vacation week for many of you. Um, we will be sending out a follow-up email. You'll have a link to this presentation. There'll also be a survey. We ask you to please respond to that survey. Um, we definitely look for your feedback and your participation during the session as well. So feel free to send a, you know, put a question in on the chat and we will uh, certainly um, try to address that during this session as well. Of course, we are always here to help. So even after the session, or if any of you are watching this as a recorded session, uh, please make sure that you uh, reach out to us and our emails will be on the final slides if you don't already have them. Um, and then as I mentioned again, please uh, make sure you complete the survey. We definitely take the surveys uh, you know, as important information. I re certainly read through the ones from two weeks ago. I talked to Karen about last week's as well. Um, so we certainly appreciate and, and value that. Part of me having kind of put this into perspective was based on that. Um, this slide came from Karen's presentation last week. And again, I just want to kind of reiterate how, how these all fit together. So one of the things that she talked a lot about was this idea of backward planning and this idea of making sure that when you're creating your grant requests, you're thinking about the priority, you know, what, how does this, this align with the priorities of, and the needs assessment for your overall school improvement plans? Um, talked about looking at outcomes that could be measurable, talked about the performance measures that you might create through SMART goals, um, talked about um, activities that you might create as part of achieving those goals um, you know, through your grant requests. 
So again, today's session, we'll be talking about some indicators that the department collects that hopefully let you think about some of these things. So as you're building your needs assessment, you're looking at that data and making sure that, yes, that truly is a need for my district. And I can demonstrate it through the department's data um, that it's using as some of the key indicators for how schools are performing throughout the state. Um, and, you know, making sure that those indicators are some that, um, and this will kind of get into the, large, the, the broader set of all these trainings, um, but those indicators are things that you can use within your grant request to look over time, um, but that in addition to that, you'll have some interim goals that might be um, specifically surveys that you develop for your, as part of your grant, uh, perception surveys, um, it could be other local assessment, um, say, assessment data that you collect, and that again will be coming in some of the future trainings over the next couple of weeks. Okay, so this is the agenda for today. Um, we are, I just wanna double check I'm doing this right. Okay, so we are um, gonna talk a little bit again about what are, what is the student data? What are the student groups data that we collect at the department? So thinking about, you know, maybe my, my focus for this grant, and obviously this depends on the title grants that you're applying for and what grants, you know, you can focus on, but where applicable, how can I focus my grant on a certain subgroup within um, my population within my school district? So are there certain grants that need to focus on limiting this proficient students or you know, students with special needs or whatever the case may be, um, but helping you understand those student groups that are collected at the department and how, how you can get to that data. Um, we'll talk about some additional outcomes. So again, last time we talked about a lot of the outcomes around assessment and accountability, we'll be talking about some other outcome data that the department collects as well. Things like suspension information or attendance information. Um, we'll talk a little bit about how that data is collected and how you can access it. And then I'm going to hopefully go through some examples of, you know, here's what I would be thinking of as a you know, title grant a grant writer and how I might go about going and getting the data and making sure that I'm, that I'm using it to um, you know, show, demonstrate the need for the grant. Um, and then, again, questions and answers throughout this session, but by all means, we'll leave you a little time at the end as well if you have any additional questions. Let me, I'm going to hop and just make sure I'm not uh, missing any. Um, chat items. So let me just check that for a minute here. Um, okay, looks like we're all set right now. Um, so this was the description of, of this um, today session. So again, we're focusing on looking and learning how um, state reported data uh, is provided to the Department of Education and then let you think about how you might use that. Okay. This slide might be familiar to you, to those of you who um, were at the session a couple of weeks ago, but I wanna make sure that you have access to these. Um, in particular, uh, these are three resources, and if you click on the links, it opens up the resources of the department's website. Um, again, the first one talks about the fact that the department collects a lot of data, and this is the one we'll be focusing on more today. Um, these last two were the ones that came from that prior session, which focused on the assessment data and the accountability system. Um, so. I encourage you once, if you don't already have it, if you haven't looked at this already, to click on the link here and open up the connection to the I4C um, system in the Department of Education. Uh, and this explains the different collections that are provided through this I4C system. So the I4C system, it stands for the Initiative for School Empowerment and Excellence. It was created um, quite a while ago. Um, prior to I4C, the state didn't even have student level data. We only collected aggregate data. Um, for many years, of those who've been in schools in New Hampshire for quite some time, you know that there's these forms like the A12A and these other forms that used to be provided to the department that said, you know, we have 20 second graders and 32 third graders and, you know, 44 or 15 fourth graders, or whatever. Um, and that was the way, that's all the department knew. Um, through the I4C system, we have so much data now um, and included that. Um, included is many of these submissions that come throughout the year. So this is the AOI is the any time of year, the BOI is the beginning of year, um, the end of year is the EOI enrollment. Um, there are things around homeschool information. There's things about courses that students are taking. Um, so I encourage you to look at this if you're not familiar with it. Um, and this data is data that the department has. It comes from the school districts, but we kind of summarize it. And one of the benefits to the department's data is that we have it regardless of where the student was throughout the school, throughout the state. So if they move from one school to the next, we have all that data pulled together. Um, but this information, for example, has like town responsible and district responsible. So every year you send us enrollment files and you tell us that, you know, Mike Schwartz is enrolled in Portsmouth High School and he's living in Newington um, as an example. And so Newington would be the town responsible because that's where I'm physically living. I don't know, and I leave this to the grant folks to give you guidance in terms of what's allowed for specific grants, but realize this data exists. So if one of the things you want to do is look at how your students are performing based on the town they live in that are being sent to the same school, that information's here or available. 
And, you know, perhaps you want to focus your grant to address a need um, related to kids, um, you know, based on um, what town they're coming from, just as an example. Um, you know, certainly the same thing would be true for promoted indicator in terms of looking at school students who are being retained, suspension information, et cetera, which we'll talk more about. So again, these resources are there. I won't go through these, but you know, certainly take advantage of them and look at them if you're um, if you haven't already. Okay, so let me talk a little bit about the key indicators that we didn't address last time that we want to make sure we address, and again, that are collected through the department. Um, the first are a set of um, information about students that really relate to the groups that students are are classified as part of, as part of. Um, these are typically student groups that are disadvantaged, at least global, you know, uh, across the country. Um, and so there are groups of students who we want to make sure the state and the federal government through their policies want to make sure are, you know, getting the services they need because, um, you know, they may be dis they may be disenfranchised or having difficulties. Um, Reported outcomes are the outcomes we talked about accountability today last week um, or two weeks ago, but these are additional accountability um, outcome data, excuse me, outcome data elements that we'll talk about today. So in terms of the student groups, the four main groups that are used to, um, through the um, reporting, especially from an accountability perspective, are English language learners. So EL students, so students that are either receiving services now or maybe students who are being monitored because they've demonstrated their English proficiency, but are still being monitored um, to make sure that they're um, doing well. Um, there are economically disadvantaged students, so we we collect that at the state, as many of you probably know, through the free and reduced indicator um, eligibility. So every school can identify any student through you know parent um, applications that are eligible for free and reduced lunch. Um, in addition to that, and we'll talk a little bit more about it in a minute, but we also get the data from the Department of Health and Human Services, DHHS, um, as well as the homeless information we get from students from schools. All of those different um, options will help identify students who are eligible for free and reduced lunch or are considered economically disadvantaged. Um, race and ethnicity. So obviously, um, you know, this is another indicator for some schools. There's not a lot of diversity in many schools, districts in, in New Hampshire, some of the bigger ones, there's quite a bit um, and certainly an area that you might be considering as you're looking at um, grants. And then students with disabilities um, are obviously students who have been identified on an IEP. Um, and again, we'll talk about how you look at some of this data and how this might be used as you're working on your grants. In terms of outcome measures or reported outcomes, we talked about the accountability data last week, so there, or two weeks ago. So there's the NHSAS, the SAT, the DLM access, of course. Um, there's grad rate. Um, but in addition, there's some other indicators that we collect that are considered pretty important through our state and federal um, programs. One is uh, certification, so making sure that Students are taught by educators who are certified in the area that are teaching. They're taught by experienced educators. So certainly another area of indicator that the department collects that you've got access to through these systems that we're going to be talking about um, and maybe something that you're considering um, when you're putting together your grants. Suspension data, so suspension and expulsion. Um, you know, there was certainly quite a change in suspension during COVID, but now that we're out of COVID, you know, some school districts have had significant issues with behavior of students. Um, students have been really kind of accustomed to being back in school. So that's certainly an area that you might consider as you're putting together a grant. And we'll talk a little bit about that later. Um, attendance and absenteeism. So making sure that students are in attended in school. You know, although schools get paid when students are enrolled, even if they don't attend, obviously it's important that they're attending in terms of their performance. Um, so we'll look a little bit at that. We'll look at how you might look at your attendance across the state to see how it compares to other schools as well. And then dropout information. You know, dropout the desire to make sure every student stayed in through school through graduation was certainly an issue that started probably about 12 years ago in New Hampshire um, under a prior governor, and it's something that had been looked at for quite some time. New Hampshire in general has very high graduation rates, but certainly there might be a problem or areas where your, your district has a higher dropout rate and might be something you want to focus on, you know, again, potentially through a grant. Okay. Um, <clears throat> So let me, I want to talk a little bit before we jump into those um, specific elements um, in terms of um, the um, ways the Department of Ed uses some of this data as well. Um, so certainly the, you know, one of the most important ones is just the commitment to education, just helping the Department of Ed is, you know, focused, the commissioner is very focused on helping share data um, with all users throughout the state all stakeholders to help improve education for students. So that's got to be you know, the number one, it seems to me, need for the data, both from us and from you know all of your roles as title grant uh, writers and um, DOE folks as well. 
Dropout prevention, as I mentioned earlier, that was really um, big many years ago. Certainly something still is a commitment in terms of making sure that we're, we're tracking every student, making sure that we've got high graduation rates. Um, graduation rate is one of the key indicators for the accountability system. So certainly that's part of the use of the data. Um, and then we'll withdraw verification. We make sure through the data that comes in from you that every student is accounted, accounted for. So if you were here last year, where are you this year if you're not showing up in a school? Um, school accountability, so we know the data is used for accountability. We talked about again a couple of weeks ago. Differentiated funding, so most of you are probably aware that um, in addition to any grants that you might get through the title funds, um, you know, you're getting adequacy aid that is dependent on or that is increased um, for students who are in these different uh, differentiated aid groups. Um, and then program commitment, um, so making sure that programs are effective. Um, the state's been using this data and is using it more and more. Um, in site reviews, um, this data will hopefully be used even more as part of the um, title site visits. Um, 21st century after school, for those of you who are involved with, with those grants, you know that this data has been um, leveraged significantly over the past year and will be in the next several years, in the next the years going forward in terms of making sure that the programs are effective. So looking at how students in the 21st century program are doing through these measures of growth of students, of students uh, being able to move and improve their achievement on the state assessment test um, from students attendance rate and suspension rate. So all that information is used now as part of the 21st century uh, measurements. So, you know, the kind of this, this whole concept of all this data and thinking about how you can make sure you're using it within your all your title grants is um, you know, an example of that is how it's being used now in the 21st century. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about how the data is collected and how it's accessed. Um, so I am not gonna go into iPlatform very much. We'll go into it a little bit later and looking at scenarios, um, but this is what we walked through again two weeks ago. So I encourage you to view the recording if you've got questions about it. Um, there's several recordings out there around iPlatform. Um, but iPlatform is one of the main places you can go and look at you know most of this data that we're gonna be talking about. Not all of it, but most of it. Um, the sources of the data. So I talked a little bit about this before, but I want to just a little bit more descriptive now. Um, English language learner data, EL data, that comes through the I4C system through an ESOL roster. Um, the department um, uses uh, this system, all of your schools use this system um, to track the students who are in ESOL. Um, it's important that you're tracking them and they're keeping them up to date so that we are able to make sure the right kids get assessed and that, that we know where the ESOL students are. Um, economically disadvantaged, this information comes, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, three different ways. It comes through I4C. There's a free and reduced submission that comes in periodically throughout the year. Um, there's the food stamps that comes in at the end of the year. We get that from DHHS. Um, and then the EOI and BOI, um, we also get things like the homeless indicator. Um, anyone who's identified as homeless is also identified automatically eligible for free and reduced lunches. So, so those different ways all allow us to develop kind of one full, as broad as we can, roster of students who are eligible for free and reduced lunch who are considered economically disadvantaged. Um, race and ethnicity, when any, whenever you first request a student ID for a student, you identify the race and ethnicity. Um, kids, students, you know, this quite frequently, they may identify, change their own identification, the way they view themselves um, through their life cycle in education. And so we do, schools do, are able to update the race and ethnicity of students through their EOI, BOI, and AOI, through this enrollment submission that you give throughout the year. Um, and then students with disabilities um, comes from the NESA systems, the special education system, and that's fed into the, the database that feeds these reports that we'll look at a little bit in a minute as well. In terms of some of the outcomes, the accountability data, we know we talked, I'm not going to talk more about that. Um, we talked plenty of about it last time. Educator experience and certification data, that all comes from the teacher certification system. Although I should also mention the educator information system. Um, I should also mention that um, as part of I4C, you submit courses, we'll submit courses and classes. That tells us what teachers are teaching what courses and what students are in those courses. As part of that course submission, we know what subject is being taught. So we can then map that to the educator information system to know whether teachers are certified in the areas that they're teaching. Um, so that comes not just from EIS, I should update it, but also, also from I4C through that course and class submission. Suspension and expulsion come from I4C at their end of the year. So the end of the year submission for every student, you tell us how many days a student or half days, no, how many days the students were suspended both in school and out of school. Um, attendance and absentee information, um, that also um, comes through I4C at the end of the year. Um, and then drop in information comes from the end of the year and the, be the beginning of the year as well to know who dropped out. Um,
There's a question. Oh, I'm sorry. Somebody's asking a question about dropouts. Yes, I'm sorry. So the question is, if a student drops out in um, the fall and the spring, but then re-enters in the fall, are they considered a dropout? And they would they would not be considered. They, they're considered a dropout for their cohort. So um, they would not be considered a dropout if they return back to school. Okay. So the I3C workbench is what I talked about earlier, which is the way mo much of this data is submitted. Um, I just give you this as an example. So this is what, for those of you who aren't involved with it, this is the workbench where you can upload files. This, for many of you know, will be changing slightly, not next year, but in 2024, 25. Um, this will be switch over to Alma, which is uh, or the index of the new system that the department's going to use, primarily for getting these submissions and having them verified. Um, the data will still end up in the department, much of the reporting, things like the ESOL roster, and many of these rosters will remain in I4C just the way they've been. Um, but in terms of submitting these submissions, that will change. Um, but schools are submitting this data um, you know, throughout the year through the workbench. Um, this is actually the calendar. So on the workbench uh, is a, or on the I4C um, um, page in the department's website is a calendar. So you can see when these submissions are due. Um, some of them come you know, multiple, multiple times, any time of year, AOI can come throughout the year. Um, so again, the state is submitted throughout the year to the department. Um, okay, so let's talk a little bit about assessing, um, accessing the data. Um, so the data, as we mentioned before, is available through all the things we talked about a couple of weeks ago in iPlatform. But one of the things that we really didn't go into was this data and report section. So I'm going to switch over right now just for a second here. Let me escape out of the presentation and I'm going to open up a new browser. And I'm going to, just like I did for those of you who are on the last call, Google iPlatform NH, um, there is this page now called Data Reports. And so this page includes on the department's website um, historical data, typically going back 10 years, um, for a variety of different information. So things about enrollment, things about homeschool, um, as much as we have it, we don't have a lot about homeschool. Um, things about staffing, uh, about um, financial information, things about demographic, like free and reduced. Uh, things around attendance and dropout information that we we're just talking about. Um, so you can click on any of this data, uh, and you can see. You can, typically there's there's two steps. One is first that that first page. Let me just go back to it. Um, will typically bring you to another page that might have multiple reports about class size, as an example, or about staff reports. Um, from here, you then can click on the report, and all of these should have a similar look and feel. But I just want to make sure you're aware of how to navigate these. Um, and so here, if I click on average class size by district, this will then open up a report. Um, and all these reports open up and should open up in a similar fashion. Um, if this has been changed um, recently. Uh, but you can now view the report for multiple years. You can drop down and choose, you know, here you can go all the way back 10 years to 2012. Um, you can get the, in this case, we're looking at class size. You can look at the class size for any district in the state. Um, you can actually search. So, you know, maybe I'm interested in Portsmouth. We'll go back to Portsmouth again. So I can click Portsmouth and search, and this will bring me to the page that has Portsmouth on it. It'll be highlighted so I can see um, the record right away and see what the you know average class size information is for Portsmouth. Um, so all of these reports, if I go back to this public reports page, all of these reports, or most of these reports are very similar in that look and feel. First, go to a page that has the detail, then open up a report, and then be able to select any year and be able to search for it. Um, so hopefully, this is a good way for you to get to much of this information, again, with the whole intent of thinking about as you're determining your need for grants, you're validating that need um, through an assessment, looking at data, potentially this uh, state account, state data that's collected. Just pause and see if there's any more questions. Nope, none right now. So let me continue on. Um, so again, you'll see free and reduced rates, information, attendance information, dropout information, a variety of different cases. What I want to do now is I'm going to switch to some examples. So We've talked about the data the Spartans has collected. We've talked about some of this outcome data as well as demographic data. Let's talk about examples of um, how you might use this uh, as you're walking through grants. I want to remind us of the discussion that Karen had last time, this kind of backward planning effort. I'm focusing on the, the steps that she talked about, building it, making sure you've got a priority, making sure that your grant is based on the a need assessment or looking at data. Um, this idea of considering outcomes, you want to make sure your outcomes are observable, um, they're tangible, 
I'm developing that SMART goal and then identifying the activities and what evidence from the activities you're going to use to make sure that you're moving back up the, up the stream um, to your SMART goal, to your overall observable, observable outcomes. Um, so again, what we're going to do is think through, okay, I, I looked at suspension data or I looked at attendance data or dropout data or teacher certification data. How does that fit into making sure I've got you know, I'm using as I'm using that as a building my needs assessment, or maybe as I'm considering some out some observable outcomes. So in these the first example, we're gonna I'm gonna say that we want to establish. I'm just thinking I'm a title, I'm a grant writer in my district, and I'm thinking about initiative. In particular, I want to establish some activities to address uh as part to to address as part of a dropout prevention program so we, we are concerned in our district about drop about dropouts maybe we're think we think that there's a large dropout issue um, we want to put together a grant where do we start by looking at some straight simple data that we might find to to validate that need um from the from the state's perspective so identify so the first thing i might want to do is identify the past three years of rates um so what i'm going to do is i'm going to switch over again and we're going to go to these reports. We're going to find our way down to the dropout data. Um, right here, dropout and completers. And I want to look at my dropout rates. Um, and I'm going to look not for 2019 before, but for more recent. So I'm going to look at the dropout rates and early exiters for my school and my district for 2020 and beyond. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm actually going to start with 2020, 2020. We got to run the report. And so as we look at this report, you can see the information that's captured here. So we take the overall fall enrollment for the school or the state. Um, we look at any kind of adjustments that we might have because the student maybe moved out of state or went to private school. You know, we take those kids out and they're not going to be included in any kind of dropout rate. And then we identify kids that might have um, finished a uh, high set or enrolled in college or dropped out. And we come up with rates. We come up with a, a early exit rate. We come out with a, a cumulative um, rate and then a dropout rate. And so if we look at the early exit rate, for example, we see it's 1.31 for the state. I'm gonna go ahead and I'm not trying to pick on anyone in particular, but I'm gonna just bring a couple of schools out for these examples. So this first one, I'm gonna take a look at Newt High School. Um, one of the things I should point out, and actually let me back that up first to the first page again. Um, one, feature, um, not a good feature, is that the column heading is drop off when you go to the next page. You can always export this to Excel, and that might be an easier way to do it. Um, but realize ahead of time that you need to think about which columns you're looking at. So again, this column right here with the percentage is the early exit rate. So if I, again, search for Newt, and I scroll down and I find Newt, I find that in 2020, my rate was 3.73 for my early dropout, my early exiters. Um, so 3.73, 1.49 for my dropouts, 3.73 for my early exiters. That that compared again to a rate instead of 3.73, I think the state level was uh, 1.3, 1.94. So uh, quite a bit higher. Um, if I go to 2021 and I run the same report, again, I can search for Newt again. And in 2021, I see that we are at... Uh, 3.88 and 2.33. So again, um, 3.88 and 2.33. Again, if we compare to the, the state, 3.88 and 2.33, um, we're you know, quite a bit um, higher than that and also quite a bit higher uh, than the annual dropout. And then if I switch to 2022 and I run the report, um, so again, you know, part of this is just to give you some easy access to data that can hopefully inform and you can use as part of your grant proposal. Um, again, we see that the dropout, the early exit went up to 2.04 and 1.48 for um, the state. If I click on, look for Newt in 2022, um, I see that uh, Newt is quite a bit higher, 6.37 and 6.33. So clearly, um, you know, I've from just looking at some base data, it appears that there's a you know certainly a need within the district where I've had consistently higher dropout rates and significantly higher this past year. Um, that certainly is one one you know tool, one piece of data that you might use to help ensure um, you've got um, a, you know the, the, your demonstrated need within the district. Um, so from there, you might also, of course, think about some goals. Um, you want to think about some long-term goals in terms of 
you know, what, how you want to maybe approach getting from the six point whatever percent you are now down to at least the state average, um, you know, over time. Um, certainly, uh, as we'll talk more in future sessions about how you kind of defend, Karen talked a little bit about last time in terms of defining those SMART goals, you know, clearly the goal and the, the effort that you may address as part of your um, activity for dropout prevention, you know, may not impact the first year or the second year. So what what are your long, short and long-term goals from maybe an overall dropout perspective, um, rate change, but what also are some smaller goals that you might have in terms of some other measurable outcomes that may not be the state data that you're using? Okay, so that's the first example. Um, the second example we're going to say is I want to improve student attendance in our elementary school. So again, I'm thinking about my elementary school. I'm thinking about my attendance rate. Let's just, again, get some basic data that will help ensure that we've got a need um, that I'm going to address. So I'm going to, once again, switch over to the reports. Let me go back to the public reports landing page. Um, we're talking about attendance information, so I'm going to scroll down to performance, and that's where we see attendance information. Just like we saw before, you click on the first link, it brings you to uh, different options. In this case, there's only one report, attendance rate by district. Um, now, I said elementary school. One of the things we we're looking at here was that elementary school um, was the concern. Um, but you'll see, even though it's at the district level, it does break it down to elementary, middle, high school, et cetera. Um, again, we, we're going to see a couple of thoughts. Uh, one is this is defaulting to 2023. We don't have attendance data yet for schools for 2023. Um, so um, we're going to switch back to 2020 and start uh, with 2020 when we're looking at this, at this data. Um, I'm going to click run report. And so this will again, you know, bring basic data back. Uh, again, we can we've got to make sure we remember what the column headings are because those are going to disappear if we go to a future page. Um, we can see that elementary is the third column, and that's a rate of ninety six percent. And so I am going to pick on Winchester for this one, Winchester Elementary. And so if I click on Winchester here and we scroll down, um, we'll find out. Although the state was ninety six percent, let's see what Winchester was in twenty twenty. You know, I for some reason believe that there's a need in my school. Maybe it's from um, conversations that have been taking place by the principal. You know, whatever the case may be. Um, and so here we see Winchester. There is where ninety five. The third column is the elementary ninety five point one. So again, attendance rate and think about it is is the inverse of absence absenteeism. So ninety five percent in attendance, five percent um, absent. Um, so again, a little bit lower than the state um, in terms of attendance, a little bit higher in terms of absenteeism. Um, not not a lot, um, but let's take a look at twenty twenty one. And again, we'll find Winchester. And here we see Winchester was down to 87.4. So um, a good bit of a drop in terms of attendance. That means larger absentee of the rate. We're now we're at 13%, which is definitely you know, significant. And then if we go to 2022 and we run the report, um, we'll see if Again, the state here, the average is 92% for attendance, so 8% um, absence. And here we see Winchester is at 84, um, so 16% you know, absentees. So clearly, again, um, you know, the need is certainly demonstrated through this data. Um, and again, don't mean to pick on any school districts. And if you think there's a problem with the data, let the department know. But uh, you know that is the data that's here. And so that data, again, is one way to help define your need for your grant and be able to tie your grant to specific data metrics that the department has. Okay, next, um, two more. And then I'm gonna, we'll be wrapping up fairly shortly. So hopefully I'll give you a few minutes back of your day. We are concerned about rising suspension rates in our middle school and want to implement a research-based program. Um, so thought is that suspension might be an issue. Um, we're going to look at some of the current rates. Maybe we'll consider some subgroups here too. Um, so um, the first thing we're going to do in this example is, again, um, we're thinking about suspension rates in our school district. We could go to, um, we could go to the um, reports that we were looking at before, but instead for this one, I'm actually going to go to um, iPlatform, and we're going to iReport for this one. Um, just to show you, just to kind of mix it up and show you another way to find the data. 
Um, and so this, again, um, and again, I'm going to pick on uh, Summersworth in this one, Summersworth Middle School. Um, and um, this time, part of the reason I wanted to come here is because in the data that we're just looking at around attendance and suspension, we were just looking at overall school. But here we're going to think about some of that subgroup information as well. Um, so if I go to environment, because suspension information is kept as part of the environment indicator, um, we can see, in fact, that for Winchester, or for Summersworth, excuse me, um, although the um, the in-school, out-of-school suspension rate is 14 and 20 percent, excuse me, for the in-school suspension. We know, and if we look here, you can see what the, the state is. The state's only at 3 percent and the district's at 5 percent. So clearly, for some reason or other, there's a significant amount of suspension going on within the middle school. Um, again, we could um, go back and look at other years. Um, I suspect if we look at COVID years, um, that rate will be almost at zero. Um, at least that was the case for most schools. But the other thing we wanted to, I wanted to point out here is the ability to start thinking about subgroups too. So again, if you click on the link here, and I'm going to, you know, if I'm implementing a suspension a program to help with uh, reduce sus suspensions within the school, I might want to consider my subgroup population. And so here, although the average overall is 20% uh, for suspensions, we can see that among multiracial groups, it's 47%. Um, we can see among economically disadvantaged students, it's 28%. Uh, military connected, 27%. Um, so certainly an area that we might want to focus some programs that address you know, specific needs um, that, are, that are meeting the needs of folks in the school who seem to have a higher percentage of students who are being suspended um, than other groups. Um, so one, one other way to help kind of define not just you know, identify the evidence, but help zero in on what a program might want to address based on some of the data that you can find. Okay. Um, so the final one we want, I want to do here is again, as you're thinking about your priorities, what are your needs, you're thinking about your outcomes is this concept that we're considering enhancements for our ELA program, um, our English language arts program, and we want to see I'm sorry about that mistake, but how our students are growing compared to schools with similar demographics, similar demographics. So how is the growth of my ELA achievement uh, students compared to school students in schools with similar um, poverty demographics? So I did some of this last week, but this is, I really feel this is very important. So I wanted to follow it with another focus on demographics. Um, so what we're gonna do here is I'm gonna start by going to um, I Explore. Because um, the first thing we want to do is see how do we compare to others. So we are going to go back to iPlatform. Um, this time we're going to jump into iExplore. And we're looking at ELA growth. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to select um, proficiency or growth in um, ELA. So if I go down to, if I can find it here, student growth in ELA. And for this one, I'm going to pick on the Sunset Heights School. I believe it's in Nashua. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and sort here. And I am going to highlight, I think I can highlight Sunset. Let's see if this works. Sunset Heights School. Um, oh, that's highlighting on, on the right side, actually, I think, when I did that. Yeah, it's showing me it's right here. So actually, I can see that Sunset High School, High School, the growth in ELA is 53rd percentile. So I should be able to flip down here and should see. Here it is, Sunset Heights School. So we see we're 53 percentile. We can kind of see where we fit in, uh, in above throughout all the schools. 50 is the middle. So that's actually not, you know, not that terrible. Um, but let's take a look at it for the past three years. Um, so we'll actually flip over to iReport for that. So I'm going to leave this open because we may come back to it. But we're going to flip over to iReport for the same school. And oops, I'm actually going to start with 2022. Um, because of COVID, we don't have growth data. We had it until 2019, and then we didn't have it again until 2022. Um, so let me go ahead and view this report. And 
and we'll go to growth. And so again, here we see that sunset sites was 53%. So not terrible. Um, let's go and take a look at the data we have, which is back in 2019. And here we can see back then it was 44%. And if I highlight, I can actually see it was 46% in 2017, 52% in 2018, and 44% in 2019. So clearly, historically, back then there was some issue with growth. It looks like we're doing a little bit better now. Um, but the other thing I wanted to point out was, again, the use of subgroup data. Um, so here we can see, um, certainly from some subgroups, so uh, economically disadvantaged is 41%, even though the overall school is 44 English language learners is 38%. Um, so... You know, again, uh, grade four seems to be doing having a little bit harder time than grade five. So again, you know, I encourage you to use this type of information to say, well, maybe the focus should be on fourth grade. Maybe it's not on um, fifth grade. And, you know, we might want to look at the achievement in, in third grade as well and see how that's doing. Um, but again, one way to look at uh, subgroup data. Um, Okay, so um, somebody asked about I achieve, and um, I achieve, as you write, is another tool that you could use, and certainly I achieve would give you that growth data um, over the years as well. Um, so that might be another place you might want to look. Thank you for asking. Um, you might have been somebody who attended the I achieve training. Um, okay, so I think that's primarily what we wanted to focus on today. Hopefully, that gave you kind of some insights and information into again um, this idea of. Uh, these different student groups and the use of those as you're thinking about your grants, as well as some of these outcome measures like absenteeism, suspension, dropout information. You know, we didn't go through teacher certification, but certainly that data is there as well. So with that, I just wanted to make sure you're aware about some of the future trainings where we'll certainly be getting into more deep thoughts about or deep deeper into the thoughts about developing smart goals around assessment data, um, thinking about other ways, both whether it's a state assessment, looking at specific things like, um, you know, uh, understanding mixed fractions or things that are detailed level in terms of curricular items that are provided through the state assessment, looking at other national assessment data and how you might use that for um, determining SMART goals. I'm thinking about perception data. So one of the things that I know is we believe is really important, and hopefully you'll be able to get out of one of the future trainings on the 23rd is this concept of developing surveys or other tools to help not only determine whether you're actually approving um, on your goals, um, but coming out with some outcome measures as well. Um, and then looking at some other rubric uh, tools that we can use around um, calibra calibration and level setting, making sure that you're you're effectively measuring. Um, so I hope you'll come to those. Um, I'm leaving you some contact information as I promised. Uh, you probably have our information already, uh, but please feel free to reach out anytime, uh, email or phone, and um, certainly want to help make sure you can make the best use of this data.